Yep. And now for our weekly news segment. Okay. What do we got? What do we got? got? Screen here. All right. All right. First, first one we got is new composition of bricks will control 80% of world oil production. With the addition of Saudi Arabia, the United States Emirates, and Iran to the BRICS, the union will be able to control the lion's share of the world's oil production. The same goes for the sharp GDP growth of the new BRICS countries. It will amount to 30% of world G- GDP and exceed $30 trillion. Big news. Any, any comments on that, guys? What do you guys think of... Uh, yeah, body has something to say. Go ahead, Body. He's, he's muted. I'm just suggesting. <laughs> I feel like he has something he could say about any of this. Um, I actually, I don't. Um, I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't see this report here. I, I am always suspicious of BRICS. Um, you know, it, BRICS has been around since, like, was it 2005? I remember when I first got into libertarianism, like, I think it was, like, 2006 I got into it. And I was like, oh, yeah, bricks and the dollar is getting replaced and blah, blah, blah. And like, it, I'm not really convinced that bricks is necessarily um, m- much more than kind of like a, a social thing. Like, hey, you know, look at us. We're going to we're we're resisting the dollar. And it, I don't know. It's I mean, I'm sure it's significant. It's not nothing. But I'm always suspicious of just like, is it really significant? Is it really going to impact the world? I'm still waiting, you know. <laughs> You know, one of the things about BRICS that I think a lot of people who are, let's just be honest, Americans have no idea about that most of the people within those countries are clear about India and China do not get along. Argentina is in the midst of like their their nationalist movement is thriving right now and they're probably going to want out so bad as soon as the the next political changes take place brazil is far from a homogenous nation you know russia and china have land disputes right now that like have almost led to war dozens of times saudi arabia can't stand any of the russian allies right now because the all of the all of the wars going on between the two of them like the, the 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 background wars, right? Saudi Arabia and Iran have a have a issue between them as old as time itself. Um, it, or another good example is like Ethiopia and Egypt. They're fighting over water use right now that could lead to a full blown like regional war. The idea that these people are just going to start working together is hilarious to me. Right. Yeah, they might work to get out from under the dollar. But then when you talk about the oh, the 80 percent of the world oil production, well, you could flip a switch and Alaska could turn into 10 percent of the world's oil production or some of these other places like Australia aren't even touching their oil reserves right now. All right. Um, yeah, I don't know. Hard to say, but it's interesting to see that you have countries collaborating to try to really compete with the dollar um so i guess to be determined anybody else have comments on that all right moving on all right next thing we've got based on random x the algorithm that is securing monero network is developed for monero uh this is not exactly true i mean it's not based on random x there's some people that were that kept saying that um but this is just is continuing basically what um what d goon was talking about earlier of the uh the new uh proof of work in tor project uh but it, it was helped designed by tevador but it's not really based on random x is what i understand i bear some guilt for helping spread a slight bit of misinformation there mm-hmm. based on my Mm, incomplete understanding there. I mean, oh, how so? It, was that? How so? Oh, just not being careful with my phrasing, not understanding uh, that it was more sort of based on uh, Equihash. Um, I mean, oh, yeah, I mean, the, yeah. The I mean, it was basically everyone was saying it was. I, I guess at some point there was this assumption that it was like somebody said something that it was based on Random X, and everyone took off of that because it's it's cool, right? It's like, oh wow, Monero Random X is now on tour. But it's like, no, it was Tevador who worked on, uh, you know, Random X is also working on Equihash. 
So yeah, I mean, I guess the underlying idea of random code generation is sort of like the the link there, but yeah, it's just totally different code base. Apparently. Which is still super cool but, that the guy who uh, worked on RandomX also basically worked on the, or at least helped the proof of work in Tor. That's super awesome. I mean, I do think that um, it's it's likely that three and a half years of Monero running the CPU-based algorithm with all of the, the incentive to attack it, I do think that it's reasonable to say, hey, Monero kind of proved that that concept can work even if the implementation is very different in Tor. Yeah, totally. Because uh, there's no other crypto that's really done it the way Monero has, as far as I know. This is It is a powerful advertisement for Monero. There's no doubt about that. And I hope that people don't stop that connection because it, the, the Tor project is already like the privacy software or the, the privacy I don't know, software architecture or whatever. And to see them moving in the direction that Monero already has been moving in, it really underscores the power behind what already exists in Monero. So I hope that that never becomes disassociated. Totally. I agree. And also, um, yeah, oh, I, anything, anything you want to say on that? Sorry, go ahead. Yes. Um, I just have, um, got, I did see this Twitter thread where um, Luke was talking about how it's not specifically, I guess, based on random X. Is, is that correct body? What you're talking about? Yeah, that's, that's kind of what I'm basing. What I'm saying here is that, uh, Luke Parker got on and said, Hey, it's, it's not based on random X. Um, and he provided some links. So they talk a lot about Equihash. They mention random X at the acknowledgements one time at the bottom and thank T uh, Tevador for, uh, for his work and helping them to understand it. So, I mean, yeah, I, mean, I think the link is that is the, pre, the proof of work CPU, the random code, the bits of random code mm -hmm. generation that all are valid uh, programs, you know, and, and then of course Monero proving that it can work in an adversarial environment. Um, I think that's the main connection, but yeah, I mean, like you guys have already covered, it's not, it's not based on random X. It's not a modification of random X. It's, it's, it's a different implementation. Oh yeah. I think it's definitely a different implementation, but the, the older devlog that, so yeah, I, I think it might be an issue of div, like um, specific choice of words because I don't know if the and if you could like pull up GitHub right and track the actual code base. I don't I don't think that would show a direct connection to random X right because I don't know like how you define based, but I do have the dev log written by Tevador from three years ago that um uh, sorry Tuxedo linked to. And it literally has Tevador going through, like in early May 22, I was contacted by tor two Tor developers to help with their denial of service attack mitigation proposal. And he goes on to describe how he started off with random X and then changed it. Yeah, yeah, he, he literally goes through the process of how he started off with random X, added all these other things to it. It is a bit old, three years old. So I mean, I guess it depends on how you define, I guess, base, you know, might be a misuse of that, like, like he, Luke might mean like it's more like the code, the actual code is not copy and paste it from RandomX, but it does have Tevador talking about how he started off at RandomX, ended up getting equal X at the end of it. But that was three years old, so I, it might be just a misuse of words. Yeah. Hmm. Maybe we'll have to think up some like more specifically accurate language. Yes, yeah, it's, it's oh. very hard, especially you know what I mean. Twitter is not the easiest place to have nuanced conversations. I'm sure we've all. Um, <laughs> all learned what? at some point in time. <laughs> so, so is ran was random X? Can we agree that random X was the the, the progenitor of what we're seeing on Twitter? Nice. Yeah, because Tev well, according to Tevador, yes, he started off with random X and then iterated on it to get equal X at the end. So I think so. According to what Tevador wrote here in front of us, he, yes, mm -hmm. he walks through the entire process of his developing equal X, which might not be the exact same implementation. But it started off when he was con contacted by two tour people to work on DDoS protection back in t May 22. So I don't know. This is this, what I'm looking at. Yeah. This software model obviously needs a name. So I propose we call it the Doug Privacy Algorithm. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. So there might be a miscommunication. Of course, I don't. I'm, I'm, I would love to see the source that you mentioned also from the most updated one from Tor, read over that and see where if I'm missing something also. But yeah, that's what I've read in my research. All right. Yeah, no, I, I definitely deserve 
less than zero credit for any, for any, of, for any of that. Um, all right, next story, moving on. All right. Tornado Cash founders charged with money laundering and sanctions violations via the U.S. Attorney's Office, District of New York. Roman Storm and Roman uh, Simonov, the two main developers uh, of Tornado Cash and the people who ran the, the website Tornado.Cash, uh, were charged with operating the Tornado Cash service, laundering more than $1 billion in criminal proceeds. Crazy stuff, crazy stuff. Body, do, do you want to give your, your take on this? I know you wrote up a great thread this week on it. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> all the same relevant factors uh, from from the uh, the lawsuit that Tornado Cash uh, leveraged, or Tornado Cash tried to sue OFAC and say, hey, you know, y'all are out to lunch, y'all can't do this, and then they lost that. All of those same relevant factors that they lost that suit are relevant here. The Tornado Devs ran a centralized website that has a centralized user interface to access the contracts. They also ran a lot of the relayers, and the way that they developed the Torn token was such that more to Torn token would allow you to vote for who the relayers would be in a particular transaction. So I've heard some people asking, well, what's the difference? You know, so, okay, they, they gained profit from operating these relayers. Um, and people said, well, what's the difference between being a Monero miner um, and getting profit from mining on Monero versus, you know, what Tornado Cash did running these relayers? And the difference is that the developers of Monero do not get profit directly from protocol execution. Um, I mean, sure, okay, if they ran their own miner, maybe, but um, that's not any kind of centralized profit, whereas the Tornado Cash devs were running critical pieces of that infrastructure, and they could have hypothetically implemented AML, uh, KYC AML, as they were asked to numerous times by the government. Now, again, I always feel it's important because people will kind of hear me say that, They're like, well, you just don't care about privacy. Like, no, I mean, I do care about privacy, but, um, and I don't think like money laundering, like without a victim, you don't have a crime. So I think this is you know, the money transmitter laws and the, and the laundering laws, these are just ways, these are just in rounds from basic human rights to go um, demand certain action of people and put people in jail that you don't like. So, I mean, with that said, under the purview of their scribbles, of their laws, their so-called laws, um, like these are, the, the problem is when you have, when you're the centralized entity that forms some kind of organization and directly profits from code execution, um, and run critical pieces of that infrastructure that most people, like something like 90% of people or more are using your infrastructure to access, even contracts that are trustless, you're still going to be attackable. And this is basically the government just telling people like, you know, you you need to develop your, your protocols in such a way that you're not personally profiting from every code execution, from every contract call. You're not running centralized user interfaces because um, otherwise they're going to come after you uh, unless you're anonymous. One of the interesting things here is that the the two guys that they're charging are U.S. citizens, um, but they mention other anonymous devs as well. So I thought that was interesting. But in my mind, the big thing here is they did not criminalize privacy protocols. PGP, HTTPS, Tor, I2P, Session. Like, there's so many privacy protocols that we have that are not that are not illegal. They're not um, criminal to use or anything. And it's well established. Like the jurisprudence of at least the West and the United States is extremely well established these are not going to be criminalized and it's not criminalizing the publishing of code. Um, they're the, the things that they're being charged with focused heavily on that central web UI and uh, the user interface and, and the re relayers that they directly profited from as a central organization. So um, it's unfortunate because like really it's, if we establish the legitimacy of tornado, there's just beyond question that Monero is going to be fine in a, in a legal sense. Um, so there is the question of how far are these guys going to push because the government does love to generate pretext, any pretext that they can to attack the things that they don't like. And they don't like privacy. They have begrudgingly accepted that we that they can't attack um, certain privacy protocols, but they're going to definitely attack the ones that they that they can legally. So, I mean, that and there, we'll talk about it later, probably. But the IRS also released a bunch of guidance this week that I unfortunately had the displeasure of reading through yesterday. But um they're, they're also basically corroborating the same thing in the way that they're structuring their proposed rulemaking. Um, so, I mean, that's that's the way I see it. It's not a direct attack on privacy per se. Um, you just have to, developers need to understand the stakes here and and develop their protocols in a robust matter and manner and not have centralized aspects. Great, great take, great Body take. With the, uh, the spicy, <laughs> unpopular, but very th well thought out and researched take as always. Is, is, it, is it unpopular? What was unpopular about that? 
Oh uh, man, I bet you it's trying to go unpopular. like, oh, this is bad for privacy projects uh, and freaking out. Kind of like this is like part of the argument you had with Chris Black, right? Oh yeah, I mean it's not bad. I mean it's you know it's it's the state of things, right? So yeah, no, obviously it's not great. Uh, but but like there's there's more going on than just they're taking down like privacy projects. It's it's all going, it's going, back, going to back to back what, what? Well, I'm gonna I'm get an echo. Can you guys uh, mute? Oh, sorry. This problem. You know, it's all going back to what Bitcoin was originally intended to do, which is to create a truly decentralized network, right? So something like tor Tornado Cash. I mean, they they could have done it in a way that was more decentralized, where there were essentially no owners controlling it and and profiting from it. But they didn't do that. Uh, they had the UI website. They had the relayers. They had the DAO tokens. And all these things kind of pushed it away from decentralized network, not controlled by any entity, yep. towards one that was clearly controlled by an entity that was profiting from it. So for people to be upset by that is to just be upset. You know, it's like it's back, it's back to square one. I mean, at that point, you might as well be using a centralized service to mix funds. Um, um, I still think that like the fact that this happened is just like not great and it sucks but like yeah there's there's a bit well, more it's, it's not great there. for great development, for development. It, it should be it should be a wake up i'm getting the echo i keep getting an echo but it's 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 a wake up call to developers uh and to the ecosystem as a whole that to you know fi find the real truly decentralized projects because those are the ones that actually have value and those are the ones that are, are true utilities whether it means they uh you know, that means that it allows them to skirt the law or even ignoring that allows them to exist in spite of the law because they just can't be stopped. And, and so it's I important for like people. Um, I'm sorry. I think you're trying to talk, buddy. I keep hearing you key in. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I was just going to say, I think it's great that people like body are like coming out and like giving the whole, you know, someone like you who can do the research on all of this stuff uh, is giving the whole the whole explanation of what's going on because a lot of people are just going to see this and this is probably what they want. They're going to see this and they're going to be worried. They're just going to be like, oh, great. You know, they're, they're going to cower in fear and, you know, stop stop participating in some of these things because of what they assume is happening when really that's not the case. Yeah, that's a great point. I think the government would love for nothing else than the entire crypto space to take the wrong lessons from this and say, oh, they just criminalized privacy and they're coming after you next, Monero. And, uh, and, and to just generate all this all this negative press, I think the government would love that. Um, I think in a lot of ways, they they live and die. These sociopaths live and die by putting bad information out there and getting people to believe wrong takes or um, problematic takes. Another thing that I think is worth pointing out is that um, it, there's kind of this like weird, perverse unification or uh, alliance now between maximalists and tornado cash uh, on Ethereum because the maximalists realize that their mixing protocols are basically weaker than Tornado Cash um, right. in a lot of ways. They're centralized in terms of coordinators. Um, I there's, there's probably some level of technical debate to be had here about how centralized, um, like for example, Samurai Whirlpool is versus uh, Wasabi. Um, but we do know that Wasabi is doing all the AML stuff and sharing with blockchain analysis, um, you know, where they, where they can, where they're able. So they've already complied. So that's probably why they haven't been specifically attacked like Tornado was. But I think the maximalists are realizing like, oh, crap, we mix as well. And we have a lot of centralized aspects like Tornado Cash. So then they're like, oh, well, they, they kind of have an incentive to, to somewhat misrepresent what's happening here and the reasons for why it happened. Um, and so they they want to generate as much public support for themselves as they can. So they, uh, you know, they kind of exaggerate and they, they make the wrong takes is like, well, if you if you're a privacy, if you're also a privacy, you need to support Tornado Cash and us um, rather than recognizing the nuance of what's actually happening. And I think it's instead important. of Hopefully, just saying just use Monero, you know? Yeah. And you just know, to keep this is I, I was just going to say, just to keep it as simple as possible, if you start talking about this with some normie who reads headlines, right? It just try to bring it back to the ethics as soon as as soon as you start talking about it and just point out you know there are people who built it in as a as a profit generating method and then there's the true uh hacker ethos right of you know the the monero devs work for free 
<laughs> right? And and they they're surviving. Well, not all of them, but a lot of them are surviving on our willingness to put our money where our mouth is and believe in the actual ethics behind how Monero is being conducted. And it's another example of, you know, the Monero community has some kind of charity project and it's funded by the end of a Monero talk. And, you know, these people who are all about Lambos and gains, you know, it's the never ending battle of fighting for their freedom to just exist. And, you know, they say play stupid games, win stupid prizes, right? Well, that's exactly what's going on is you compromise a little bit over here. And then the masters of compromising on everything, politicians and lawyers, right? They come along and all of your gains go into their Lambo and their gains, right? Yeah. Uh, Moving on to, uh, we've got... I, I just want to give, I just want to get one more take. Uh, so you know hey, we, we talked about things like Samurai Wallet and Whirlpool. We talked about it a little bit last time, but body, how, how do you think this affects something like Zcash? I think it would affect them if anyone used them for like in let's just say in adversarial uh, environments. Um, if anyone actually used Zcash for nefarious purposes and like it to a large extent, um, then they might have some problems. Um, they're, they're, I mean, you, you'd have to like, for example, tornado cash would be a stepping stone to getting to Zcash. If that's what you wanted to do. I doubt the government cares very much because I just, I haven't seen any numbers that would suggest that Zcash is facilitating anything that the government doesn't really like. Um, so I, I think they're fine for now, but if, if anyone actually used them, they would have problems. I, I think the government would take, they would be the next logical step in my mind. Mm. And use them shielded since it's uh, still opt in, as far as I know. Yeah, I think yeah. the opt in is another argument against them, right? Because it's, it's clearly people opting in for the purpose of, of essentially obfuscating their funds as opposed to default just using the protocol. Yeah, they, they've got at least a little bit more legal strength there because they could say, hey, you're never actually mixing your funds. They're not going to a common address. Like on ETH, everything was going to a common Ethereum address or account, you could say. They call them Ethereum accounts. So, I mean, everything about it certainly had the same feel as a regular mixer. The only difference being that instead of on a private server, you're just on a public blockchain. But all the other elements seem to be present Whereas at least on Zcash, you would say, hey, you moved into the shielded pool, but but you didn't actually co-mingle your funds with anyone else. Um, you're just part of a broader um, anonymity set. But you do still have the Tornado Cash, sorry, the Zcash developers taking 20% of um, of every block reward. Oh, yeah. So, got, and they have a corporation. So Right. That's that's the, the bigger issue there. Uh, that that they, would be they an interesting are, case. They are say, an entity, actually. right? They are an entity, I, you know, from what we saw that summary judgment that was made in this case it seems like they would fall into the category of being an entity yeah the difference of course being that they're actually like a blockchain distributed protocol that facilitates um that only facilitates the movement of funds and um reading through the irs guidance yesterday um they kind of made a big deal over whether or not you're providing additional contract services versus just um facilitating the transfer of funds um, that's kind of like a whole other can of worms to get into, so I won't go into into it deep. It suffice to say, it would be very interesting to see a Zcash like uh, court trial happen. Not that I want that to happen. I'm not saying that. I would prefer them to just stop the government. That is, um, but it would be they have a much stronger case, and it would be very interesting to see how the government, um, the nefarious party, ar argues against Zcash and what kind of um, I don't know other arguments and evidence are brought to light in such an environment. I don't think that will happen, but you know who knows. Hmm. All right, all right, all right. All right, so this was posted a couple days ago um, from Zenu on Twitter. There needs to be more thorough investigation on the hash rate spike that happened to XMR, XMR recently, where all of a sudden a mining pool had over 50% of the hash rate. Something isn't right, and prominent Monero community members are ignoring this. I don't think anyone is really ignoring this. I think it's kind of one under the radar, because um, I had seen this briefly, I think, a week ago, but I forgot about this myself. Um, where, uh, yeah, under mining pool stats, it was basically nano pool, uh, for like a small amount of time had over 50%. And it was like, it was weird because it was like, it went from 
less than 40% to like 55% in a very, very, very short period of time. And uh, people are just basically speculating on exactly what happened. No one really has any uh, any idea at the moment, as far as I can tell. Um, maybe somebody has like a, a server yeah. farm or owns like part of a data center or something like that. I mean, I'd love, I'd rather just go hang with my parents. Uh, yeah, anybody with, with good insight into this? You know, one of the things that can happen in these situations, and I don't know, but um, there are a lot of people who, you know, write software to utilize unused hardware as basically as a virus. You could think of it like a virus where, you know, as, as somebody could have just gotten access to a lot of computing power all at once and it was mining in a pool and all of that just kind of showed up all at once. Um, this is one of the reasons why peer to pool is so critical. And also one of the reasons why I'm such a strong supporter of Monero Noto, because I think that Monero Noto could actually lead to plug and play Monero mining devices. And, you know, if it, if it's a default peer to pool, it, it spreads out hash rates so evenly and in so many locations all at once where this becomes ever increasingly difficult to happen, even randomly, even for a few minutes. Um, Monero lends itself to hackers, you know, infiltrating devices and using, using those devices for hash power. And in some ways, that's kind of a good thing because it makes it more difficult to centralize it in some aspects. But then when it comes to pool mining, it makes it easier to centralize it in other aspects. What are we at with percentage for P2 pool? Currently? Seven to eight percent. Okay, so it's it's slowly climbing over time, right? Yeah, it is. Still got to get it up there. Um, but I mean, of course, it's still newer compared to uh, all these pools. But Nano Pool has been uh, it's been the big one for a while, and see now it's sitting at if this site is you know it's some some of this is hard to calculate, but if this is accurate, then it's around thirty percent. Uh, but that discrepancy of going from you know like you know, like for 40%, 55% and then back down. So it's pretty, it's pretty wild. Um, but we've seen this before. Something similar happened a few months ago where um, it wasn't, it wasn't a pool specifically, but it was like the hash rate suddenly uh, skyrocketed within a day and then went down. Um, I think it almost doubled and there were a lot of speculation around that. Um, what was like, some speculation? that somebody somebody just owns part of a data center or something and they're just like you know testing testing something out or you know nobody really knows it's it's hard it's hard to know with this kind of thing but uh the best way to prevent any uh malicious activity from happening is just for, for everyone to join join in on it right you're, you've got an extra computer that's just sitting out you know old laptop you don't know, use it just pee to pool mine on it right um as long as you can afford the energy cost, because uh, I know for some people it's that might be an issue depending on where you live. Um, and of course, running nodes is always a good thing too. But if you want to help secure um, good hash rate, then just use extra hardware you have or laying around and use P to pool. Yeah, that, I guess that's the point Alaska Anon was making as well, right? So yeah, yep. it's it's up to us, right? The, if if you want to fight, help fight the war, just start mining on your CPU. Uh, and as we spoke about at length, what, you know, we can do that here in Monero. We wouldn't be able to really necessarily do that in Bitcoin land because we don't have access. No, to yeah, it. we don't have the expensive. Yeah. Price, price also plays a lot into this and uh, on and off ramps play a lot into this. You know, I, I'm probably one of the quickest to say one XMR is one XMR because from, a, you know, economic exclusively view of this, that is true. But the thing is, is if Monero has a certain price, then it, it it increases the the regular guy's ability to get involved in uh, mining. And the other thing is, a lot of people who might be interested in mining XMR, they need that on and off ramp to pay the energy bill, or they need that on and off ramp to subsidize their costs in certain kinds of ways. So. If they can mine XMR and then, you know, cover some of their grocery bill because your local farmer's market does accept XMR or whatever, 
these things cannot be isolated. They cannot be looked at as just like a one-off situation. Hold on. <laughs> and so. even uh, even if like you, let's say you've got like a nice beefy computer, like for instance, I've got I've got a a decent processor. It's got a lot of cores. Um, and most of the time, I'm using you know I'm not I'm not using all of them. So even if you like, let's say you have one computer, but it's a good computer. Uh, and you want to still be able to mine. Well, you can set it to use four, six, eight of the cores and not use all of them. So you can just have it using part of your CPU and not all of it, but you'll still be contributing. Uh, and that's interesting what HPS just said, that hash fault had a 1.4 gig hash a second spike last week. Mm. HPS, jump on. Tell us about it. Yeah, if you have any speculation. I mean, what, do you, what do you guys think about the fact that, you know, Monero, it's obviously anybody can mine with the CPU, but it, it really is not that profitable or for most isn't profitable. What do you guys think about that issue? Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's what I was getting at with, uh, with the price thing and the on-off ramp thing too. There are a lot of people that would absolutely mine it at a loss, by the way. If they could just take the 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 value of the XMR and quickly go buy stuff or quickly you know get cash for it or whatever, yeah. um, and this is another example of like, it, you may not be tech savvy, but believe it or not, you can improve the the hashing power of Monero by just being a local Monero exchanger, right? If it, because if a tech savvy person can walk down the street and trade you some XMR for some cash. They a lot of them, that's all it would take for them to get involved. Right. Or another thing is, is um, the, the I'm not a big fan of like the the buy and hodl, buy and hodl model as like an answer to the price thing. But it plays into it where if you're storing at least a decent percentage of your disposable wealth in Monero and you know you don't budge from certain price points because you know what it's actually worth what you're doing is you're increasing the hashing power because now the demand for the monero that's being mined that needs to be liquidated for covering the cost or for buying the groceries of the people who are knocking this out and then the last thing is is like with the monero noto project yeah, running your Monero node and having access to a, the, all of the functionality of a light wallet while simultaneously having all of the privacy of a full wallet, that's an incredibly attractive proposition on its own. But beyond that, building out from there the tech to have a plug and play automatically updating Monero miner that meets the, the threat model of the average miner would be unbelievably valuable to the to the stabilization of the hash rate especially if the default is when you plug in when you plug this in you are automatically mining on a peer to pool system um so all of this ties together and if it, you know this is another reason to keep up uh, you know watch your monero talks to keep up with the latest developments on all of these things because if if you want to reduce there's all kinds of little solutions and changes that can be made to try to prevent like a nano pool from taking over. But the real solution is to continue to build out the infrastructure. A lot of these things only exist because of the, the, the market cap of Monero and, and um, the need to continue to grow out the existing economy. And I think a lot of people that, um, a lot of people that do it, like, obviously, you know, there's, like, it's quite a large hash rate, and this this won't be for everyone, but I think a lot of people, like, um, what's the guy that just commented? Forever Metalhead. Uh, a lot of people just do it at loss because they just want to be able to help the network. Um, and how many people that is, I don't know, but I feel like there's a decent amount of people like that because, like, pretty much everyone I know that does mine, they're like, yeah, you know, it's, it's not really making me anything. It's at a little bit of a loss. Cause yeah, you're going to get, you're going to end up burning some XMR, but it's probably not going to make up for the energy costs, especially if you live somewhere where the energy costs are really high, but they just do it because they, they like Monero. And at some point, maybe, you know, there's a realization where like, Oh, because of how low the fees are for Monero, it like ends up, making it like worth it for me to to mine even though i'm at a little bit of loss there just because the fees of using it especially if you use it a lot are so freaking low compared to something else hmm. but like 
you know, Alaska and I was suggesting too. It, 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 you're getting a lot for that electricity spend, right? You're getting KYC free. Yes. Yep. Uh, freedom money, right? Freedom, freedom, gold, digital gold, KYC. It's, it's legal money laundering if you think about it, because you know your energy bill is a bill, your energy bill is a cost of living, and your Monero is off the grid. Um, I mean, I'm not saying that that's something that I do, but that maybe theoretically might be something that I do. Yeah, I'd rather pay <laughs> to support the cash Monero than uh, for, for hashing. You know, would be a, a great pay for other financial services. Um, but uh, yeah, this is uh, this article. This is uh, going off of the previous ones of Tornado Cash founders charging rest by U.S. government. Um, and then we've got this another BRICS post, a very a very long one um, by Megatron. Oh, we could skip uh, that. I mean, we about kind the of BRICS summit. That um, then we've got uh, the EU just voted to let banks hold two percent of their capital in BTC. Uh, and laser eyes are going crazy about this, of course. As Rudy's report, the Economic Affairs Committee of the European Parliament on Tuesday approved a bill to implement the final stage of the post-financial crisis global bank capital rules, Basel III, starting in January 2025. It stipulates that uh, volatile cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin will be considered the riskiest investment. All right, but it's a, a step in the... In the right direction. It's good to see. Yeah. Yep. I I don't actually know that it is a step in the right direction. And one of the things that concerned me about this is the the prospect of dumping. Hmm. So what I mean by that is, oh, if you have dumping. these big institutions that are using other people's money to collect significant portions of the total market cap of crypto, you're also creating a means by which they can dump into the market to push the price down or they can buy into the market to artificially inflate the price and two percent of a trillion dollar market cap is a lot of bread so like blackrock etf kind of thing right yeah and i think that a lot of people are very short-sighted when they think about yay my institutional adoption <laughs> it's like yeah the institutions are part of the reason why the dollar sucks <laughs> like, well, they have this x amount of control over this what's supposed to be a heavily decentralized currency so yeah it's it's i guess in a way it's good to see um because it's like the whole idea of, well, at least they're, you know, starting to accept Bitcoin, which, you know, does give people the sovereignty. But Bitcoin is kind of like a very, uh, a very compromised version of what a, a digital currency really should be already. Uh, but I mean, really overall, what we're seeing is the competition of money, right? And the competition it's of money. Yeah, I think yeah, that's well, sort of with things like the bricks, um, you know, and what's you're, you're seeing all these different uh evolutions of money take place where they're competing to be the best form one other thing that concerns me about this is uh okay so with monero these exchanges are the means by which they can do uh uh reserve banking right where because you it's a little difficult to audit when some of these snaky sleazy people whether or not they actually hold keys to the monero that they pretend to be selling um, now, with the transparent blockchains, it creates a little bit more of an issue for re uh, fractional reserve investments. But that's that's kind of what I'm getting at is this may be their answer to not being able to do fractional reserve with these transparent cryptos. And it will also have an effect on Monero where, you you know, the, that effect where if Bitcoin goes down, well, Monero must go down. I better sell, sell, sell. And then they use that to scoop up the 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 Monero that they're going to use for fractional reserve. Um, it, it's and I'm trying not to make it like super complicated when I talk about it, but suffice to say, it it works in the favor of giving the same people who have been using fractional reserve to keep everybody slaves in the first place. They now have a vehicle by which they can fractional reserve something that is the whole point of Bitcoin was that. Oh, you know, if, if a Bitcoin is traded, then a Bitcoin is traded. Well, they can take a huge chunk of it off the market and then they can wait until the, the timing is better for them. And then they can sell it off into the market, crash the price, buy it up somewhere else, low key. 
and then sell that supply back into the tax supported government funded, you know, slush funds where the slush funds will pay more, but the people who bought it at the low paid less and they can, it's, it works to basically incentivize even more corruption when you do these kinds of things. Cause remember if they have 2% of their assets in Bitcoin, well, they're going to lend out a thousand percent of their assets in loans. So you're attaching a, a, a solid currency like Bitcoin or sort of solid currency like Bitcoin to fractional reserve loaning as well. And that's, that's, that's exactly what they were trying to get rid of when Bitcoin was created. Yeah, just to kind of um, echo that and, and provide an analogy, think about how gold is its own sovereign bearer asset. And what did they do with gold? They Because it, it has portability problems um, and has risk when you, when you move it, um, it got locked up into vaults and then they were able to fractionally reserve it. And they basically took control of having sovereign reserve money um, by fractionally reserving gold. Um, and then what do they do with gold? They suppress the price. They, they want to keep people in stock market. They want to keep people anywhere, but having a sovereign asset. Uh, and so we've seen them create all these mechanisms to suppress the price of gold um, with paper gold and, uh, and trading on these various um, commodities exchanges like the COMEX and, and whatnot, the LIBOR. So the more and I, and I don't think like a lot of people that are like super pro Bitcoin, they think that they're winning as the government integrates Bitcoin. And in some ways they are, but they're also like that also builds out the infrastructure by which Bitcoin's price can be ultimately capped at some level. Um, because, again, kind of um, kind of like Alaska Anon said, as they integrate this, they're going to create the control mechanisms for price. They're going to have paper traded Bitcoin on lots of different markets. Maybe they can add it to their reserve assets. So now they can fractionally reserve there or they can create more dollars on the basis of the Bitcoin that they're fractionally reserving. Again, because of the port portability problems that Bitcoin has. Yes, when no one's using it, it's highly portable. But the moment that people start using it, it becomes very unportable. Lightning Network doesn't seem to be solving this. So all of the other proposed solutions right now are stuff like Fediments and and um and custodial solutions which are not real solutions so like this is a double-edged sword for anyone that's um you know pro bitcoin here and uh and pro institutional adoption this is like the beginning of the end of mad gains if you will for bitcoin the fiatization of bitcoin get ready for a wild ride to the moon guys <laughs> our, uh, our compromised currency that's gonna end up not being any better than the fiat system Lambo now plucks. Uh, so last, I think this is, yeah, last article we have is this one's um pretty crazy, but KYC mining pools have more than 50% of the Bitcoin hash rate. Yeah, this blew so, me away. I didn't yeah, know. That. This is like, like just going into the fact of like the, the kind of culture that Bitcoin has been co-opted into where it's just, instead of it being this whole like, free private thing where people have full sovereignty over themselves and their ability to mine and their ability to use the money people are just willingly giving up these informations to use a mining pool right not even just to mine so it's just a mining pool can we please just look at the irony of the names of those two pools foundry and ant pool <laughs> it's just like you have got to be kidding it's like they might as well just call it like slave pool or servitude pool or. <laughs> and of course, oh God, it's in, uh, of this one's U.S. based founder USA and Ant Pool is Chinese based. Uh, so that's it's that's like the, the bug men have a, a pool that's literally called Ant Pool. Right? <laughs> I mean, is, isn't this the scenario that we've been yelling about from the top of our lungs that would happen in, in Bitcoin and the Bitcoiners kind of said, no, this would this something like this would never happen. Don't do this, kids. Your hash rate matters. Send it to only pools that deserve it. Well, I guess nobody listened to uh, nobody listened to this fine gentleman here. Yeah, well, uh, at least fifty percent so of people did not. <laughs> what do you guys see as be, is this the inevitable trend for, for Bitcoin, or is there? Is there Giacomo or, can beg everyone to send their general. hash power. <laughs> Giacomo can beg everyone to send their their hash power to um, non KYC pools, but there are studies out there. At least one study that I read that showed that 50% of hash power is controlled by 0.1% of the entities. So like mm. you can beg people to do it, but if you don't have decentralized mining <laughs> and it's all controlled by large corporations, oh, that 0.1% uh, corporation and government. 
Could I point out that the timing of this couldn't be more hilarious too? So like the minute that all of these people are like, oh, I can be a reserve asset now is the minute that the 1% literally have over half of the wealth generation mechanisms. Like it's, you can't separate the timing of this from all of these other stories about Bitcoin that keep coming out like, and then the, the laser eyes, they just can't help themselves. They're just like, let's march right into the concentration camp as fast as we possibly can. I don't know. Just It just seems like the walls are really closing in on the Bitcoin mining. Well, what said, though, if it's true that like that much of the um, the Bitcoin hash rate is, is controlled by 0.1% of entities, and that's like, well, I mean, at that point, it's already like, what's, you know, is this really the worst thing compared to that, right? Like, it's like, all right, so the 0.1% of entities, that's like what? Like, it's got to be people who own just a crap ton of... Uh, a crap ton of ASICs and have a large control of like, you know, big mining uh, businesses or like even governments, potentially. I don't know any details. Just so do just what, FYI, what do you, that was a 2020 study that, that said that. Right. So, I mean, how, how crazy do you guys see this getting? What do you see as being the future of the Bitcoin mining network? Do we, does the, fu is the future of Bitcoin look like a, a system wherein essentially transactions are, are censored at will? That there are these these lists that uh, you know whatever OFAC compliant lists and all all miners now now follow these regulations. Is that the future of Bitcoin? I mean, they're already you know starting to like you know censor at like the um not not the um the actual protocol level of course, but like on the end for like centralized services of like oh you got tainted coins. But mm -hmm. at some point, I mean like. Especially because of how, like, we're just talking about the Monero, where it's like everyone, you know, there's a bunch of people in the comments saying that they mine Monero because they can. It's easy for them. All they need is, a, you know, a basic computer to just add a little bit. But with Bitcoin, like, I don't know a single person. I don't, any, I don't know anyone personally that mines Bitcoin because you can't unless you buy one of these, uh, you know, ridiculous ASICs. I mean, even then you still can, but it's like it's really meaningless. Uh, like, what, what is Giacomo's current argument as to how this? how bitcoin won't be become completely captured and susceptible to censorship by governments at will i'm i'm, I'm just not even seeing the argument anymore what is the argument who who's know. who's going to mine bitcoin and, and validate these transactions that you know that you get a take on that body <laughs> i don't think he has an answer um it would be <clears throat> it would be nice to put it to him and say hey yo like what is your solution? What do you think is going to happen? How is this going to develop? And what mechanisms do you see there for your your vision of the future actually happening? But I don't I don't think that he's got any good answers. Like it's the direction was set two years ago. It was very clear as soon as Mara announced that they were going to be Marathon Digital announced that they were going to be doing um, uh, compliant blocks. That was like, oh, OK, got it. Yeah, of course, because all of the hash power is known and. Bitcoiners like to say, oh, well, we'll just move to a different country. We'll just move to a friendly jurisdiction. Mm, China already kicked you out. So there's like one eighth of the world that you're, you know, the population you're not allowed to mine in China now. Um, so the world is kind of like closing, closing in. It's getting smaller. There's only so many times you can move countries before you're out of countries to move to. Oh, and by the way, that's very cost prohibitive. Um, like it's not, you can't just like pick up your mining farm, find a friendly jurisdiction that will let you use their electricity um, on the cheap and then move all your shit and construct a whole new mining. Like that's, that's such a difficult thing to do. Um, so it's like, okay, at some point, like you can see where this is going at some point, all of the mining is going to be, have made their KYC deals. Like why would they make a KYC deal with the United States or with the government only to then leave? Like they're not going to do that. So at some mm -hmm. point, um, probably FinCEN or some kind of like regulatory framework is going to emerge across all of Bitcoin mining. And, they're very likely going to try and pick up the OFAC compliance again. They're going to, at some point, they're probably going to start orphaning blocks. Maybe that doesn't have to happen soon, but you can definitely see that's the clear direction. The momentum is towards that direction. And eventually transactions are going to be censored. And even if you have some miner in Kazakhstan or whatever, that's, that's going to mine the OFAC censored transaction, their block is just going to get orphaned. So no one will be mining prohibited transactions at some point. Like that's, that's where things are going. And unless some major change happens, some major change to their ecosystem, it's 
it's not going to stop going that direction. I, I don't think they have a good answer for that. They'll probably just yeah, subscribe yeah. to something like price. <laughs> right. And what's crazy is this is kind of what we were saying before in the other story. And all while this is happening is that the price of Bitcoin will likely continue to go up. <laughs> this will effectively be good news um, because it's going to mean that Bitcoin is going to be more integrated into the state. Right. And uh, it's going to get to the point where they're not threatened by it, uh, but it's just this perfectly traceable and controllable piece of digital property that people it are already was like, you know, storing their wealth in but real but really are they i mean uh it may have dollar value but it's uh completely surveilled and censored at will i want to add some good news to this though for the based monero enjoyers out there such as ourselves bitcoin has basically volunteered to become the test net for centralized mining and they have basically de facto volunteered to demonstrate the consequences of compliance and it, we're also going to learn a lot about managing orphaned blocks for future monero development from all of this um it, 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 it as a person who started as a hardcore bitcoiner like you know a hundred bajillion years ago you know, there's part of me that dies a little inside every day, even though I didn't even realize I still miss Bitcoin. But like the, the thing is, is I can also recognize that it is doing a great service to Monero development by following this path, because it will allow us to further harden and resist all of all of this, you know, um, and very little is known about orphan blocks other than what's done on these these small scale test nets. But Bitcoin is about to give us all of the data we could possibly need about compromising with the enemy.